He's able to keep his sense of humor. A few days ago, he rang in the new year with a series of tweets charting the last 10 years. Beginning of the decade, I was completely broke. My credit was shot. I was driving a 97 Camry without a door handle. My health was terrible. I was single. I'll close out the decade with an amazing wife, three lovely kids, a Honda minivan, better credit, and a career. Keep hustling. Wajahat Ali. Welcome to our little Chobi Mela. For those who don't know, Chobi Mela is the first festival of photography in Asia, and it was created by Shahidul Alam, a singular force who has dedicated his life to the pursuit of truth. Photographer, author, curator, and activist, but not always in that order. He gave a voice to those who could see but were not being heard, arming them with the language of photography and empowering a generation of photographers to turn the camera on themselves and their culture for the world to see. There are those in this room who know you personally, those who know about you and your journey, and those who know of you. And all of us are happy to see you here today, because while you may not have been in this room, your presence and influence has been held, felt here for many years. Please welcome Shahid al-Alam and Wajahad Ali. Thank you, Vince. Uh, if I wasn't married, I could score two dates off that intro. That was amazing. Uh, how's everyone doing? Thank you for that overwhelmingly enthusiastic response. That was, that was awesome. Lovely. Uh, thank you to, to my people, the proletariat, watching from the cafeteria uh, and the spillover. Thank you to all those who are watching us uh, on the YouTube. And thank you to Shahid al-Alam, who has come here all the way from Dhaka, Bangladesh, to be with us today. Uh, for the Storyteller Summit. Thank you, Chef Good to be here. Cool. So, Shahid and I met three years ago in Dhaka uh, when I was actually working with uh, Facebook, Google, and the UN to help some young Bangladeshi change agents and artists. And I just reached out to you through our mutual friend, Salma, to be a judge to help mentor these kids. And you came by, we met, and this was before you were public enemy number one. A lot could happen in three years, right? And, and, and I, I never would have thought that here, here we would be in Washington, D.C., in the nation's capital, three years later. Uh, you have a very eventful life, my friend. And as we talk about it, and I think it's very important, Time Magazine Person of the Year, celebrated photographer, many people who, who are watching, they're like, oh, Shahid Allah, I'm so inspiring. I wish I could be like that. Who am I? I'm just an average Jose or Joe. And I think the origin story of you superheroes is very important. And if I may, I want to begin with, you know, we've talked before, and I always, I always call you the accidental photographer. And this journey began with an accidental birth. Can you explain that? Okay. Well, it was a candid moment. The picture is of my parents, uh, my brother, my sister. Uh, my dad's a microbiologist. Uh, my mum's a school teacher, two kids, nice happy family. Uh, my dad's elder sister passes away leaving four orphans and a family with two kids becomes a family of six kids. Uh, my mum does extra work, my dad does too and they make, make ends meet but they certainly don't plan on a seventh child at that time. Yeah. But well it happens. Uh, so it was much later I think when I'm 29 or something like that, but that my mother candidly tells me, you were an accident. <laughs> well, did, it, did it sting at 29 or <laughs> you're like, damn, mom. No, it, we, we have a very, well, she's passed away. We had a lovely relationship and it was nice the way she said it as well. But she's... <laughs> <laughs> but, but speaking about your mom, if I may, you know, your mother is this force. This Four foot two and a dynamite. And, 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 and you know, we're going to talk about this not only as you as a photographer, as an artist, as an activist, but education runs deep. And it's almost like a genetic inheritance for you. Can you explain that? Yeah, well, uh, my mother, um, she's in uh, Kolkata. Uh, my dad wants a uh, an educated wife. Smart man. Uh, 
completely. But, you know, he, he's a microbiologist in the army, very eligible bachelor, lots of people want, you know, lots of applicants. But then he wants, he wants an educated wife, and my grandmother gives in. Hmm. She's not really interested in her, the bride going to university. So my mother puts on a burqa, and my dad's younger brother takes her to visit her friends, and that's how she graduates. After partition comes over to Bangladesh, my mother wants to set up a school. No one's interested. So she pitches this tent. She buys a tent for 10 taka, pitches this tent in the middle of a playground, 14 kids. It's now possibly the best known school and college for girls in the country. Yeah. I, I just want to, I just want to repeat that, that one woman, a four foot something dynamo, uh, takes a, just pitches a tent and fast forward five decades later and you just said is one of the best well-known schools in Bangladesh. Continue, please. Uh, and of course in the school she does more than teach arithmetic and maths, music, theater. I was involved, that's my mother teaching me to play the harmonium. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that is part and parcel of what this is, but not everything was easy. But I'll come to that later. Three women, very important in my life. My sister on the left, Renema, my partner in the middle, uh, my mum on the right. Uh, uh, powerful personalities and didn't always go too well, but I'll pass on that for now. Uh, but but, but important how they shaped you. I mean, completely, your, your completely, muses yeah. throughout life. I, I can continue to be. I mean, they're very important women, but other, well, men too, but other very important women, with Saivia, who, uh, Renema, for instance, while I was in jail, she went every day to jail. Mm. Uh, no one could convince her. She, basically, she said, I don't trust these guys. I want to be here. I want to make sure you're there. Uh, she made that trip every day, but the other, Saivia, my niece, Salma here, Chuli in Sri Lanka, Nayantara in uh, Nepal. I mean, they've all played a huge role. But I'll move actually to 1971, which for me was very significant. This is a picture by Penny Tweedy, and she actually gave us that print when we first did Chobimala, as was mentioned. Um, and this is a woman going through a field with a rifle. I mean, I don't know who she is. Mm. Uh, disappeared, perhaps. In the history books, this is not a person who will feature. But the War of Liberation was our battle. All, all of us, we wanted liberation. And for me, uh, what was very significant comes to this image. This was taken on the 14th of December, um, 1971, the killing fields of Rai Bazar. Mm. Uh, taken by Rashid Talukdar, who actually won the Pioneer Award at National Geographic before it was discontinued. But um, for me, what was very significant was uh, how through that war uh, I changed. And what happened immediately, this was something that was being done by Pakistani armies when they knew they were going to leave the country, they were losing. They wanted to cripple the country intellectually. Yeah. So the leading artists, scholars, journalists were all invited. Uh, and this is what we found on the 17th of December. We got independent on the 16th. So the nation was crippled. And um, you know, my parents wanted me to carry on studying. My sister was in, in Liverpool. So they managed to cobble up a ticket, a one-way ticket. But, but can, you know, if, if we may, for those of you who don't know, with the 1971 war, I mean, it was, uh, you know, Bangladesh was called East Pakistan. And for those of you who don't know geography, Americans are really bad at geography. There's Pakistan, this small country called India, and then Bangladesh. And so Bangladesh, from the inception uh, of 1947, wanted its own independence. And this 1971 war, it was one of the worst rapes of the 20th century. It was Pakistani Muslims taking vengeance against Bangladeshi Muslims. And in Pakistan, to this day, you don't mention this. It's, 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 it doesn't happen. Or if it was, it, was, it was their fault. And there is this lingering trauma. And I, and I, am, I appreciate that you mentioned that, that they went after the intellectuals because they always go after the artists and intellectuals and thinkers. 
those are the, those voices are always the most threatening. It seems to power. So uh, <laughs> I just want to. No, no, no. It's, it's important, and here I suspect. Native Americans get left out in Britain, colonialism get less left out. So there are those uh, accidental omissions. Yeah. Uh, but um, so I'm in Britain um, and I'm from a middle class home. So you, you're meant to become a doctor, an engineer. That's it. That's a, all you can be. Doctor, engineer, yeah. business, yeah. failure. Lawyers. OK. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I, I study biochemistry and genetics. Um, I graduate. I g then go on to do a PhD. Good Bangladeshi uh, kid yes, so far. Exactly. So good. far, it's all checking the good. boxes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's the stage when I get introduced to the Socialist Workers' Party. Left politics. Get very involved in race issues, uh, um, class issues, all of that sort of thing. Poli um, Poland, Solidarność movement. And um, that's when I discover the power of photography. Uh oh. Exactly. Uh, and I think, you know, does Bangladesh need yet another research chemist? And your mother would say yes. <laughs> but precisely. <laughs> yes, Shahidul, yes. So anyway, they don't know about this. I'm doing this PhD. Of course. But while I'm doing this, I'm taking a few pictures and uh, I decide to test it out to see if I can actually yeah. make a living out of it. And uh, there's an advert in a newspaper for photographer in a small studio called the Young Rascals. Mm. And basically you take pictures of kids. So I'd go around, spread a sheepskin rug, a blue background, and take happy pictures of kids. It paid well, $500 a week in those days, lots of money. What I also did was amateur photography and things like that, and then I'm doing nude studies on myself because I'm the only one available. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, but that was that was it's it's like that's what's interesting. It's all DIY, right? You had completely, no training. Completely. You got you got possession yeah. of this camera, and you're like, this is interesting. Let me just go out and see what I can do. And actually, getting the camera was also a bit of an uh, interesting accident because, you know, this was Freddie Laker days. Some of you will remember the Laker Airways cheap, ninety pounds you could get a London to New York flight. So I thought, poor student, this is my chance to go to the United States. So I get on. I, get on a sky train, a friend of mine tells me, cameras are cheap, dollars low, buy me a camera from the United States. So I go to, I'm not sure if B&H was there, but Hessian Jewish shop, you know, I, I buy a Nikon FM, a tripod, and a rickety tripod, a flash gun and everything. And I go around, hitch, those were the days you could hitch, hitching around the United States, hitching around Canada, come back to London. He doesn't have the money to pay for it. I'm stuck with a camera. So I take some pictures and, you know, this next one is from that period and Richard, uh, Richard Moses will be jealous. This is infrared photography. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful photo. Thank you. Uh, but, you know, that's what I was doing, trying to take pretty pictures. But this really wasn't why I'd come into photography. Uh, one very interesting thing happened at that time because um, I was taking these pictures of kids, but I wasn't happy about the photography I was doing. Yeah. So I complained. They said, what are you talking about? You're our star photographer. You make more money than everyone else. Everyone $500 a week. Yeah, exactly. Crushing it. Yeah. So I started thinking, you know, if I stay in this setup and everyone tells me I'm a great photographer, I'll start believing this. Yeah. You know, I'm in the zone of comfort and everyone tells me nice things. I mm. thought, too dangerous. So that was when I decided to make a clean break, go over to Bangladesh. I'm going to become a photojournalist. But of course, I've got no track record. I've never worked for a newspaper. I don't have a portfolio. This is what I want to do. But, you know, there was money to be made. In <laughs> this, this, my friend, is truth to power. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. This is the war on Christmas I, I waged took, by Muslims. Yes. I, I took rats. I took pretty women. I took flowers. Whatever came. You had to you know? pay the bills. Well, exactly. But. Um, Something else was interesting. I decided to go back home and live with my parents. They're very important people in my life. I'd left home when I was 17. I came back as a 29-year-old. I wanted to know these people. And I knew it wasn't going to be easy. I'd lived independently for all these years, go home. Uh, in my parents' house, middle-class home, there are home, there's home help. And this little boy, Mizan, he cleans what we call the drawing room where we watch television. Yeah. Uh, except that he's, he's not allowed to sit inside to watch TV with us. He sits outside that doorway. And what we'd done by then, we, we'd set up a, 
an agency, I'll come back to that later, but we were using calendars. And calendars at that time were, they had pretty pictures, you know. We don't have naked women by waterfalls, but we have, you know, sort of mosques and nature and pretty women, things like that. We decided to use our calendar for social messages. Mm. So this picture of Mizan watching television was printed in our calendar. I gave a copy to Mizan, I gave a copy to my mother. The following day, Mizan sat inside that room to watch TV with us. Yeah. Very it's, powerful it's, moment. Uh, and I think for, for people, just if, if you've ever gone to South Asia, the, the class divide is so immense that this is a revolutionary photo to have someone literally invade and enter that space. Uh, it shows you that all politics are personal and how you can actually change a mindset of your family with one single photograph. And this was my own family, very emancipated right. pe people. But so what I'm also doing again, I, no one's hiring me to do photojournalism, mm -hmm. but there's a general. I've left an independent nation. I've come back to find a general has taken over. So I'm in the streets taking pictures of the resistance. And the street the Azad was one of, this is at the Shahid Minar. Mm. Uh, later on, this young man was very important. On his back, it says, let democracy be freed. And on the 10th of November, 1987, he was killed by the police. This is at um, a campus. Uh, in fact, the university where my partner used to teach where she set up the first department of anthropology. But um, so I'm taking these pictures, but over a period of time, I'm 88, we have a massive flood. Um, that's when I get commissioned. You know, that's when people suddenly find an interest. Trauma, pain. Yes, exactly. You know? Poverty uh, porn for the West. This struggle for democracy, no one was interested. No one cares. Yeah. But come the, come the floods, I get commissioned. Right. That's not bad either. But while that's going on, uh, there is this wedding. Uh, the wedding of the daughter of a powerful minister. Taking place at a time when the nation is reeling under this uh, devastating flood. Everyone's there, you know, the who's who of Bangladesh is there, but no one mentions a word. The minister is the owner of a very, very powerful newspaper. Uh, everyone knows the rules. Interestingly, uh, I tried to show this work. It was going to be shown on the 10th of November, 89, mm. exactly two years to Noor Hussain's death. Alias Francaise, the sponsor, backs off. It's bicentennial of French Revolution, 1989, but that doesn't seem to matter. Um, so, I, I don't have a sponsor, I don't have a space. We put the show up anyway. Can, can, if, you, if you don't mind, can you go back to the previous yeah. photo? And then now just go back to the wedding. So I just want you to reflect on this, on this because in Pakistan, in India, in, in Bangladesh, this is common. If you were to tell people this, they'd go, yeah, this happens all the time. Why do you think the juxtaposition of these two photos, which are so common and well known to everyone in Bangladesh, Pakistan, South, in India, is so dangerous to people. Well, everyone knows, but no one speaks. Mm. And I think that's, that's where the difference is. And while those connections are what we make, we don't specify them as such. And here was I challenging a military general, challenging his minister, and talking about the reality at a time when the nation was reeling under those floods. Mm. But something else happened. Um, these pictures, the flood pictures anyway, Again, the West is in, interested in floods and disasters of all sorts. So this exhibit went to the side gallery in, in Newcastle and um, then to um, a show in Belfast. And I'm staying with Irish friends, um, Paddy and Deborah. They have a lovely nine, five-year-old daughter, Karina. And I'm back from the show. I'm putting some coins in the pocket. And she's standing at the doorway staring at me. I say, what's the matter, Karina? She goes, you've got money? Yes, I've got money. But, but you're from Bangladesh. Mm. Yeah. Five-year-old girl. Five-year-old girl. And I, it got me thinking about the sort of social, political, cultural environment within which a child grows, where she's incapable of seeing a Bangladeshi as anything other than an icon of poverty, because these are the pictures she's grown up with. Uh, and that has been our, uh, you know, our identity. Uh, so. That's when I decided I would set up an agency so we could tell our own stories. And, and it's so powerful, right? Like when people hear us say that, because, oh, you're always whining and complaining. 
But and I'm looking at that frame to your left. What gets in the frame? What gets left out? And what gets left out is the the narratives of 150 million people in Bangladesh to the point where a five-year-old girl, when she thinks of Bangladesh, she just thinks this. This is unimaginable. Well, there is the other side as well. We did manage to get the general down. Right. And suddenly, this, the same gallery that had turned our show down because actually they'd said, it's photography, it's not art, so we can't show it. Right. Yeah? Uh, but the same art gallery, once the general goes, accepts to show photography. And in four and a half days, uh, in three and a half days, we had 400,000 people coming to see Wow. Them. It was incredible. We had near riots at the entrance. Uh, and people were just being shoveled in. And it's, you know, we had no money. It's cardboard, right? <laughs> yeah, like exactly. Cardboard. Yeah, but you stuck cardboard and tape. That's I it. love it. That's it. Uh, but, you know, for us, it was still very powerful that photographs could have that engagement and that people were so hungry for those images. How was the response? Like, if you have 400,000 people literally coming just to see photos on cardboard, how, how, did, how did the people respond to the art? They were blown away because, you see, another very interesting thing happened at that time. The military general had censored, uh, and initially the newspapers started redacting spaces, and then they decided they wouldn't publish. Uh, so that was very brave. They, with the military general, they decided they wouldn't publish, so the people were hungry. Right. They, they wanted to see, and they, we finally got the general down. So there was huge response, but what it also led to was a, an election. And for me, this image was very important because I felt that she, with her vote, right. was avenging Nur Hussein's death. But then, you know, elections, we, we tend to think elections are all there is to democracy. Hope change. <laughs> uh, and I soon discovered otherwise. The campaign, this is Khaled Azir, who later became prime minister, on her campaign trail, it's joyous, and exuberant. This is Khaled this year after she gets elected. Mm. And, you know, the relationship between her and the public sort of changes. But, of course, it's true for all of them. Uh, again, we, we taken all these pictures. No one was interested. 29th of April, 1991, a cyclone. Suddenly, everyone's interested in pictures again. And the New York Times contacts us. We want those pictures. They even <laughs> sent us sample pictures. We have them. But... And, you know, we've just started a small agency, New York Times, big client. We don't really want to lose this, but we thought, you know, we've got to say it. So we write to them to say, we got those pictures, but we don't think that's the story. So Nancy Lee, the deputy picture editor, to be fair to her, says, OK, tell us what the story is. And we did a full page spread on the New York Times about farmers replanting seeds, fishermen going out, fixing their boats, people helping each other, and to the best of my knowledge, possibly the only photo spread of that time that didn't dwell on bodies. Mm. So that was important, but we felt, yes, it can be done. But we also thought of other things. Um, you know, while I, I was questioning what white Western photographers got me in doing, but I, as a male middle-class photographer, was also someone in power. Right. You know, if I'm photographing a woman who doesn't have a door to shut on my face, the control is with me, and she very rarely gets to decide what image it'll be. So we decided we would challenge our own position. And um, so this is a group of 10-year-old working-class kids we started teaching photography That's to. That's great. Um, and um, both girls are significant. The girl on the left is Rabea. The girl on the right is Molly, who later became my assistant and now is an editor in one of the leading newspapers. So the first day I'm working with them, uh, we did this, we also started training women photographers. The first day we're doing this, uh, I show pictures to Molly, well, and other kids, and Molly looks at this picture. This, this is a picture taken by one of my students, Aziz Rahim Puyu, who's passed away, sadly. Uh, and she says, oh, that's the fire in number 10. What happened in number 10? What's that to say? The owner took the bodies and dumped them in the drain at night. Hmm. How do you know? Everyone knows. What happened? Nothing ever happens, she says. And then Wade says, if I had a camera, I'd take his picture. I'd put that guy in jail. Hmm. Now, here I am, a photojournalist. You know, we know our pictures often don't make a difference. But the fact that this 10-year-old girl had that belief was something that, that fired me up. Can, can, and can I, if you don't mind me asking, when, you, when she was given a camera or when she was given your mentorship or when she 
I'm assuming had someone like you just believe in her, what was the change, if any? No, well, well firstly, we just had fun. You know, right. We used to go around. And I, I remember the first day I said, where do you want to go? So they gave a ho whole list of, they'd go to Cox's Bazaar, they'd go to Sundarbans and photograph a tiger, they'd go to, the, you know, this was a huge list of what they were going to do that day. Uh, and we'd go around, you know, and I had a little station wagon, and yeah, there were 11 kids. They were meant to be 10, and they took another one on, so there were 11. We'd all get into this. Every five minutes, I had to stop the car to change so someone else would sit in the front seat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it went. We, we, we had fun. Uh, and the pictures in themselves were interesting, but I think what for us was more interesting is they were telling their own story. Right. And they were telling very powerful stories, stories that were not being told up till that point. Uh, and that, uh, we might not have the time to show that, but that became important. But I also began to look at other things. And this was uh, a series where I, I worked on the river Brahmaputra. And I show this simply because this is also the time when I'm trying to make the international connections, the river and how it links. This is a river that goes from China to India to Bangladesh and how different countries control rivers and how the relationship people with rivers changes. And that was the first time I went to Tibet. Mm. Um, and then uh, Wasfia Nazreen, who played a very important role in freeing me when I was ar uh, arrested, uh, was uh, very involved with the Free Tibet movement. So she wanted us to show. show. So you've now, now this is the step in your career where you're an international troublemaker. Well, getting there. Uh, but I'm a national troublemaker too. And so we have this show. Uh, I don't want to, yeah, I'm not going to deny you that role. Of course. So not. this is Professor Muzaffar Ahmed, uh, who was the um, chairperson of Transparency International, who we invited mm. to open our show. But a show in Tibet, Chinese government leans on our government, who leans on me, closes on, down our show. So we have the opening in the street, and the government provides a nice background. <laughs> <laughs> they were there to protect you, Well, of course. absolutely. Yeah. You'll see more protection later on. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're uh, aficionados of art, absolutely. of course, yes. yes. Uh, so, but then I also look to see how else I can make work, because you know, if I'm working very directly, then shows get stopped more easily. So at that time, there's something that's happening called Crossfire, which was mm. a euphemism for extrajudicial killings. And I decided to do a show on that. This is something that was bothering people very much. But, you know, the rapid action battalion who did the killing weren't going to take me along. Yeah, by the way, we're about to do a crossfire. Come along, take some pictures. Yeah. So I had to find another way. And I didn't want the show to get closed down. So what we did was a lot of research. And we created images which we felt were the last images that the dying person might have seen. But we did something else which was very significant. When I showed the earlier picture of the wedding, uh, it was turned down everywhere, but it was reviewed by a magazine which belonged to the wife of the minister. And I was very surprised, you know, this show you know, being reviewed in the, the wife's magazine. But they gave a beautiful review of the artistry of my work, the strength of the composition, the black and whites, and all that sort of thing, completely ignoring the politics. Of course. Yeah? Yeah. So I decided, OK, my work will have the politics embedded within it, so they cannot separate it. So for this next work that I did, um, all the pictures were taken at the time of the killing. Mm. When I spoke to the survivor, uh, well, to the family members, they talked of how ta torches were shone on their face. Um, so every picture was lit by torchlight. And the data was in a Google Earth map, and you had to dig for it. So you would then come and see how in this pristine paddy field, there was a body, and the paddy field was undisturbed. And the body had several bullet holes, but the shirt he was wearing only had one. Mm. So slowly, the story begins to unravel. So you, you literally went to the killing field and revealed it. Uh, but uh, I'm also trying to find other ways in which the politics and the art are intertwined. It, it, but it's interesting, you're, you're Trojan horsing it. Completely. Because you have to within the constraints of the society you live in where showing a photo, uh, well, as Well, I wouldn't now, have been allowed to show those that's photos. What I'm saying. But also, I, I actually found this to be more powerful. Hmm. And this was perhaps the most 
uh, effective exhibit we've had. And in private conversation, Rapid Action Battalion has actually said that this exhibit was the most difficult period in their career that they had to deal with. Yeah? Can, can, if you don't mind, if you can unpack the why do you think this image, this image had that effect? What's the power of this? I think the questions it raised, because they closed the show and there were policemen outside, so I interviewed the police. Uh, and I'm asking him the same question. You know, he's a paddy field, what's the problem? And he says, yeah, it's a paddy field, but you look at the word crossfire and you realize what must have happened in the paddy field. Do you make the connection? That's why people will the get horrors angry. Of the imagination. That's why, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and I said, does everyone know what crossfire is? He says, my three-year-old daughter knows what crossfire is. Mm. I'm filming him, of course, while he's doing that. <laughs> and then later, Susan and I, we were talking about this at Tate Modern, and I show that film. So this policeman gives a wonderful conceptual analysis of my work, which I then <laughs> include in my work itself. So that's the way we work. But I also started looking at uh, other issues, at the indigenous community. Indigenous, by the way, is something, uh, let me show you this. This is a technique that I developed uh, specifically for this work. It's on straw mat, which is where, what the Baharis used to sleep on. And it's being burnt by a laser beam. And it's, it's a process I developed for this, for this work. Because a lot of my work at this point is about disappearances, about the missing. Photography is very good at rendering the visible. It's not as good, it, or it doesn't lend itself as naturally to what is missing. So a lot of my work since then has been about what is invisible. And I was telling these stories, these are the settlements of um, the Baharis who've um, occupied this space. But it's a woman called Kalpana Chakma who was disappeared by the military. And I, I'm doing this story um, 17 years afterwards. And uh, in this dark place where you go into the gallery, the first expression uh, experience you have is the smell of the burnt grass. It, it's and the candles are lit by one by one. It's performative in a sense. And then a very powerful poem written in the Pahari language. By the way, the word indigenous is illegal in Bangladesh. You can get jailed for using the word indigenous. Our government bans it. We don't have indigenous people. Uh, I am who I am, and I will resist. I shall defy. So these are people reading, chanting back the same words. And it was a very powerful experience. People had tears in their eyes uh, at the end of the show. So um, how, how did the government respond to this? Well, this is interesting. They closed down the Tibet show. They closed down the Crossfire show. We knew when this was happening that the military was surrounding the gallery, but they didn't close it down. You know, we, we gained some space. I think, you know, we sort of in this cat and mouse thing. But we've continued to do the work and we've done it in, in ways in which uh, I think makes it more difficult for them to stop. But I'll move on. Uh, this is um, a picture I took in 1996. Stephen Mays might be somewhere in the, back, in the audience, but yeah, he was then with Network Agency and they were doing a story on HIV and AIDS. And I recognized that it was important to show it in my country because at that time, the images of HIV and AIDS were about skeletons, right. dooms and everything else. So we wanted to deal with the stigma. So I uh, do this story and the woman sitting there uh, laughing uh, is Hajira. Um, these, she's a sex worker in the grounds of the House of Parliament. That's her beat. Uh, we became very good friends. We've stayed friends ever since. And that's also one of the joys of, you know, I live and work less than three miles from where I was born. This is my community. These are people I know. And Hajira, you know, she had a very difficult life. She was gang raped as a child. She, she you know, really very, very difficult life. And then I discovered that she'd taken all her savings to set up an orphanage Great for other stories. kids. Uh, we can uh, applaud that. <laughs> we can applaud that. And, and when I ask her, you know, I found out she doesn't take a salary. So how, how does it go? She says, well, you know, we helped and other people had helped, you know. Uh, I, I have a roof over my head. When my kids eat, I eat. I have 30 kids who call me mum. What more than I, can I want? You know? And of course, you know, the floor is the slate. 
And right. she's very strict. They have to pray, they have to do their studies. They the handwriting is excellent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's But that. I mean, it, it's so important, right? Because like, regardless of society, it's sex worker, stigma. Yeah. And then AIDS, especially in South Asia, you don't talk about it. And if whoever gets it, of course, is a sinner. And then you show this photo that this person who's a sex worker dealing with this is actually using their life to empower others. It's, it's so radical and disruptive. And she's such a beautiful woman as well. What we also did with the Positive Lives work was that was the first time we showed gay people. Um, they don't exist, right? Like, well, we have a health minister who uh, said, we can't have AIDS because we are a Muslim country. There you go. <laughs> anyway, so along with that, we're doing other things. And you know, I'm showing my work. And I, I, I had my first show at the Goethe Institute. I invited all my friends, my clients, but also the janitor and the cleaner and everyone else I, I used to know. No one went to, the, none of them, none of the subaltern went to the show. The so, people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So why didn't you go? And they, they asked me a very pertinent question. Would they have let us in? Hmm. There is no rule that prevents them from going in, but I suspect that another doorman of the same social class would have stopped them from going in thinking that was his job to do. So I thought, okay, if they can't come to my show, I'll, the show must go to them. So in Chobimala, we've, we've got things like this. We've done shows on boats. We've done shows on camels. Your public exhibit. Exactly. If, if the people won't go to the gallery, the gallery will go to the people. I, and, I, and I just wish we could just stay on this for a second because we need this in America. Big, right? Uh, who can afford some of these tickets? Yeah. Uh, and it's not that we don't have an appetite for it, we do. The, the proletariat and the commoner would love to see beautiful art if only they were sometimes allowed in or could pay the price for admission. Just saying. Continue. Uh, uh, what we also did was um, we l looked to see how stories were being told. And I don't, I'm not showing the picture here, but I'll tell you a little story. Um, again, during the floods, um, I have a camera, and if you have a camera, you're a journalist. You know, that's what the assumption is. These kids want me to take pictures. So it's nice light. I keep, there's a large open window, Rembrandt-like soft light coming in. I stand the kids by there. They're standing up at attention, posing away. And I take the picture, and I realize that there's a kid in the middle who's blind. Hmm. I thought, this blind boy, why is it so important for him to be photographed? And I've thought about it a lot. I mean, essentially, in mainstream media, in media generally, the people who matter are the stakeholders. And that happens to be the punter who pays, buys a newspaper or whatever, the shareholder and advertisers. No one else matters. And certainly the rural poor in a country like Bangladesh does not matter. So that story never gets told. So what we started doing was to give the iPod touch. This is 2011. We worked with World Press Photo. We set up a partnership and we started training journalists in the village to tell stories, multimedia stories from the village, which went directly to mainstream media. Actually, it didn't go to mainstream media, at least not in Bangladesh. They weren't prepared to pay for it. it there had to be an economic model. It didn't work. But Dorshevelli does publish it, and we put it online. And there are about 1,500 stories from rural Bangladesh. And where they, for once, are the protagonist of the narrative. It's their story. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I think, just you know, quick aside, what, that bl the story you just said was so powerful about the, the blind kid who knew. Like, even though he can't see, he, he wants to be in the frame. Well, and he there, wants to be represented also. Well, there is a bigger point. You know, for me, why was it important? I think that rural poor child will only exist as a statistic right. when it comes to the media, when it's large numbers or things like that. You and I will be individuals, they will not. But if a photograph is taken, that's the time when that person exists as an individual. And my idea that through a photograph I could transform a statistic into a person. A human. A very powerful a narrative. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Absolutely. But of course we used our work for other ways as well. I mean, we were very much about social justice, about human rights. And when one of the many attacks on Gaza took place, we held a show to raise money, to send, send to the Palestinians. Uh, so we were doing all those sort of things. There was the agency. We also set up the school, right. uh, which became a very important school at a later stage. And this picture is of Professor Yunus at 
the award ceremony. And you'll notice the girl on the right, that's Rabea, who you saw much earlier looking at the oh, contact wow. sheet many years ago. Yeah. And the school did very well. Right. Um, uh, for me, what was very important is, you know, when I started the school, I was the only local teacher. And I would arm twist my friends, very generous, to come and sleep on my floor and teach. And they did. Robert is there and many other people have been teachers there. But what for me is very important today is out of our 26 teachers, 24 are former students. It's organic. They are the ones who set up the school. And they, take, they argue pipeline. with me all the time. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's one of the pipelines we, we should uh, employ everywhere. So yeah, let student, me just... Student to teacher. And well, exactly. And very fine teach, mm. uh, students and teachers as well. This is by Taslim Akhtar. Uh, you, many of you will know this image, quite well known. Um, and this is by Assad for some unknown magazine. Uh, you know, but they, they're getting... Up and coming magazine. Yes, yeah. yes, it'll get there. Independent. Watch out for it. Yeah. Buy shares. <laughs> <laughs> it has a future. Uh, and, and this was done by your former student. Yep. Uh, and Taslima is now a teacher. So both of these pictures uh, are... I, mean, I just think that's so powerful. A former student, a young girl in Bangladesh who no one would invest in. You gave her a camera. You gave her a little bit of training. You just invested a little bit, just a little bit of your time and care into her. And you fast forward two, three decades, and she has a photo on the cover of one of the most prestigious magazines where photographers from around the world would die for a cover photo. Completely. That's, that's thanks to you. Thanks to us. A lot of people there. But uh, I should also mention the picture of um, uh, Professor Muzaffar uh, with the police at the back. That was taken by Andrew Biraj, uh, again, a former student who was with Reuters afterwards. But anyway, so let's move on. So this is the backdrop. With this is an amazing Roy. action shot, my friend. <laughs> This, this is your so Facebook profile photo. Well, there you are. There's <laughs> Moinid Din, um, who took this picture. And, you know, th th so these are what's been happening. Uh, and you're in the thick of things. By now, I'm, I'm actually being able to make a living as a photojournalist. Right. Before, I wasn't. So, but while this is happening, there are other things that are going on. And this is... Um, this is powerful. This is, these are the scratch marks uh, on the soot of a garment factory as people are trying to flee the fire. Yeah. This is Tazreen fashion. What, what was the response to this photo in Bangladesh? In Bangladesh, it didn't get used very much because mainstream media, it's too abstract and things like that. It got used in my own story. And there it had a very powerful response, but it didn't get used by mainstream media. But we had other ways of doing, dealing with it. So. Part of this story was of the carcass of the same time when I took this picture, I took a picture, a panorama of the carcass of the factory. The, what happens in garment factories, I mean, the fashion industry uses garments. So we decided we'd use their space to show the work. So this is a billboard we set up outside the building, which is the owner, owner's association of the garment factories. Mm. And what we did was we actually smuggled in audio tracks of the wailing of the people, Oof. played it in the middle of the building. People came out mm. hearing this sound. We had a performance outside and there's this. So they don't know what the heck's going on here. You know, They've just run away from this wailing to come up to this. And I do need to tell you, you, know, you might have had the impression when I'm saying all this that our government isn't receptive to the arts. You know, uh, uh, they gave us a backdrop earlier on. When we had this show, they received us. You know, they, nah. <laughs> they respond to things like They this. love art. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so we're showing that. And then I go on to other things. This is a poem I wrote, um, The Sundermans. Uh, we, is the world's largest mangrove forest, uh. a UNESCO heritage site. At the moment, there is a coal-powered power plant being built there in collaboration with India, because we are beholden to India. So, you know, while we, we owe a lot to India for our independence, the fact that you know, we are now pretty much owned by them is an issue. But this, this story is problematic for a different reason. There has been a young boy called Abrar Fahad who was murdered because he critiqued India on social media. Mm. You know, that, that's how difficult it gets. Uh, I'll just skim over some of these images. But this, is, well, this is really powerful. I mean, I hope, what, how, how, let's do it. I think it's a sin to bore an audience. How are you guys doing? Are you guys with us? 
All right. Uh, and and Shahid and I realize we're the enemies keeping you from lunch. Uh, but if you guys are with us, right? We're good? All right, good. We'll, we'll be fine. Can, uh, this one is beautiful because where do you guys think this photo was taken? That's, that's a question for you guys. Anyone? Yeah. Where, like what structure, what building? Gar okay, we're, tell them the answer. It's the Baitirov Mosque. It's a mosque, it's the interior of a mosque. And in fact, that was also part of the idea. I know, I, it, there are conservative uh, groups who think photography is haram. Uh, forbidden. Forbidden. In many homes, when you pray, you turn the photograph around particularly if you have figures. Uh, so I thought, okay, if I'm going to intervene, the space itself will be my intervention. So I decided I would do a show in a mosque. No way, you know. So I thought, there's this beautiful mosque called the Baita Rof, which is designed by a woman, Marina Tabassum. The land has been donated by her grandmother. So there is this women's involvement as well. And I thought, okay, I spoke to uh, Marina and we, we looked to see how we might do it. So the original mosque of the Prophet in Medina had a very different purpose to being merely a place of prayer. It was a cultural space, it was a community center, it was where education was given, it was a health complex, he received foreign dignitaries, uh, women could stay there. Uh, there was a tr an artist troupe from Abyssinia who came and said, we need a place to perform. And he said, use my mosque. So it was also an exhibition space. So I told these people, you know, I want to take your mosque to where the, how the prophet had intended it to be. Now, that's a pretty powerful argument. It's very not, powerful, you know, yeah. So not too easy to turn down. And I said, well, one condition only. Everyone must be able to go to the show. Mm. So we had the show inside the mosque. And people who'd never entered a mosque before came to this place. Now, we did have a slight problem before that because there was a local mafia, so not very happy with this, and we had to take the show outside. Uh, we did it in the grounds, and then the women and the kids came and said, why is it not in our mosque? So they took it inside the mosque, and I had to do nothing. But this is a show we're hoping to tour in other places as well because Islamophobia is something also I'm very concerned about. It's very transformative, not just for Muslims, but also for those who otherize Muslims, especially Completely. in the United States yeah. right now. Oh, please continue. So uh, the Rohingya um, situation, so I'm, I'm photographing that. But what I need to tell you is that I've been photographing the Rohingyas from uh, the early 90s. It's a story now. It's a story that's been there from the 70s. Yeah. Um, so I, I was in the boat with with these group of people coming back and the baby with the green uh, in the green you'll see the picture later on um, uh, i could see the mother was tired so i took the kid and she was quite happy relieved not to have to carry the kid and the kid was i like kids so we get along so the kid was with me and you'll see that picture later on but a more interesting thing happens more recent thing happens this is august 29th of july 2018 there's a road accident and two students get killed and students come out and protest. Um, and while I'm photographing this, I realize that um, the government have released their mafioso with machetes attacking these unarmed students. And I'm reporting live on this. Uh, I give an interview to Al Jazeera. And as a result uh, of that interview, this happens, yeah? Um, so, uh, and yeah, I spent some time in the entertainment of the government. Um, Where, I mean, if, and, and, and you, know, you have a very nice sense of humor <laughs> about that, which, uh, which is very lovely. I think it keeps you sane, but they tortured you. Initially, um, I was tortured and then they offered a deal. You know, um, everything's forgotten, all control, delete. We take you back home, nothing on the record. You stay quiet. And that was the condition. You know, I could stay quiet. I refused. I got taken to court. This is a picture of me being taken to court. I spoke out in court. Um, then I got put to remand. I spent six days in remand. I go to jail. I spent time in jail. But while I was there, so many people across the globe, and I see many people here, but in Bangladesh, where it's so much more risky to do that, 
people took incredible risks to campaign for my release. And it was really unbelievable. And for me, being in prison, it meant a lot, not only to me, but also to my fellow prisoners. Right. Because they recognized that this was a people's struggle against a repressive regime. Uh, so I'll just show this picture. This was also taken by someone I've mentored, and that's the same kid uh, mm. taken during the Rohingya period. So this was part of the campaign going on. And these were people, some unknown people who, you know, stood up for me. Desmond, uh, so Desmond Tutu, <laughs> yeah, heard about him, <laughs> up and comer. But in yeah. fact, I, I say that in jest, but... All I these people came out. It was an inter, it was a multicultural alliance it, that it, came out to help you. And many of your peers here who were just outraged by the fact that you who have done so much for art, for your community, for education, simply for trying to tell the truth, were arrested and tortured. And you were the Time Magazine, one of the Time Magazine's 2018 People of the Year, rightfully so. And so it's the least that the rest of us could do. Uh, and that's the power of an artist and that's the power of a storyteller that the story eventually escapes. It, it can't be contained. And, and so many people here love you and invest in you. That's also why they came out Please. to help you. And, you know, there, there are many people here I don't know. So if some of you can put me in touch, I'd actually like to thank them at some point. But that's another story. Media. Um, so what the government has done over this period of time is they've, they've pretty much demolished all the institutions, the judiciary, the police, the education system, all of that's gone. So this is the press club in Bangladesh. And those are pictures of the prime minister dangling from the press club. Whereas at Drik, the new building we're trying to build is Assange. And I should bring it home. I mean, dis dissent is not appreciated wherever you go. So it's not so. So we also have our own uh, version of access journalism. Absolutely, absolutely. But I was then going to, while I'm in jail, um, there's this, my sister and my partner, they come up and they, you can't talk, there's so much noise in there, it's very difficult to converse. So they have a little sign saying, um, do you want to do a show at Rubin? Yeah, well, why not? So anyway, and that decision was made while I was in jail. Um, later on, we were able to work on it. But Even in jail, you're a troublemaker, sir. Well, exactly. You, know, <laughs> you, you, you stay faithful to yourself. <laughs> you're loyal. You're consistent. <laughs> Thank you. So, but one of the things we did was, of course, I, I've been photographing the invisible, but now I don't even have a camera. Mm. And that makes photography a little bit more difficult. So what I did was I started working with my niece, um, Sophia, who's an architect and an artist. And we thought rather than work with uh, Google Earth maps and things like that, we'd work from memory. The memory is a perfectly valid source. So I spoke to her and she started making 3D models based on my period in jail. Mm. And um, this one is of me feeding the sparrows uh, from my jail cell. Mm. Um, so this is in the Rubin show right now, a little model. But um, one of the things that's happening now is because of the situation I'm in, I can no longer move around the way I did. So I've got to find other ways of producing work. Um, I no longer have the mobility. I can't go around on a bicycle because it's too dangerous. Uh, I have to, I don't use a mobile phone. I have to constantly let people know where I am. So my normal way of working just is no longer valid. So I've developed other ways of working. And this is a story I'm now doing on survivors of torture. But it's using a small mobile studio, which I can take because it's not safe for them or for me. And we can find a small clandestine place where we can work, set up the studio, and I do these portraits. And I talk to them about um, the moment when they were in, in mm. that situation. And uh, it's, it's painful, perhaps, but it is a space we try to go to. So this is work I'm doing now. This is um, the building where Drik and Pachala are going to be. So my challenge now is succession. I want to hand over. Uh, to this next generation and okay. we also have to live several more decades. So yeah. just But just, this just this table, table the retirement for okay. Now. Okay, but uh, anyway, so this is the new Drik Pachala building great which we will move into in March hopefully uh, And I will end with uh, an image which for me was very important. I mean I was looking at 
the, the jail pictures and other things. Not that I'm recommending jail, but uh, I actually had a very productive... I, I, firstly, I... <laughs> okay. Prison okay. was very fruitful for your, well, yeah, for your artistic yeah, yeah. career. <laughs> but um, also, I, I used that time to its maximum. You know, uh, I interviewed people every day, and it, it's not so difficult. You know, people have time. Yeah. You, know, you don't need to make appointments. Mm -hmm. You know, you know where they live. Yeah. So I, I could go and do, <laughs> do appointments, which I did. I, you know, I did all these interviews and whatever. The prisoners took such good care of me. Right. And um, there was one instance where I was put in a special place where ordinary prisoners weren't allowed to go. They sneaked into my room, took away my mosquito net, mm. Fit, repaired it, washed it, put it back in, because they didn't want me to get bitten by mosquitoes. Mm. You know? uh, and all sorts, at every level, the things that they did. But for me, the most important one, I showed you the picture of the river earlier, that was deliberate, because this is a mural that my fellow prisoners have painted for me inside prison. It's there now. It's amazing. Yeah? If it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a testament to your, not just your creativity and your artistry, but your spirit. It's the generosity of your spirit, which has touched the prisoners, which has touched students, which has disrupted and angered the right people. And we've run out of time, but entertain me for two minutes if you can. Because, you know, Shahidul kind of glanced over his life right now. He goes, oh, I, you know, I just ride my, I have to ride, I can't ride my bike anymore. It's okay, I'd get stuff done. But we were talking yesterday at Pete's Coffee, this is very elite establishment. And I was asking him, you know, tell me about the impact and the cost. And he was telling me, he says, you know, I have to tell people where I'm at all the time. Uh, he used to ride his bike freely. He, he works like literally three miles from where he was born. He cannot ride his bike anywhere. Um, your friends are being squeezed to isolate and pressure you. Money is being tightened. They are doing all of this to restrict your art, to hurt your financial sustainability. I mean, he has paid a price. And I just want people to kind of realize that, that he's still paying the price right now. Things are very difficult for him in Dhaka, and yet he's still doing this. And so how can we help you take it to the next level? Firstly, I think you need to challenge your own government. Because, yeah. <laughs> And I'm not merely talking about the political situation. You know, the reason these things happen is because it's made to happen. So, you know, there are people, there are countries that talk about human rights and democracy, yet we've had a government that's stolen an election. We've had what's happened to me. What's happened to me is minor compared to what happens to many others. Yet, as far as international community is concerned, it's business as usual. Right because they would much rather work with a pliant dictator than with some messy democracy. And as long as my government is prepared to deal with the Rohingya issue and deal with the war on terror and you know, create, deal with your agenda, a few human rights abuses, it's okay. We don't really mind that. And I think those tough questions need to be asked here. That's one. The other is I am interested in the people I'm one person. There are so many people back there who are working incredibly hard. And I think we need to find ways in which we strengthen these institutions so that they can be robust, then they can withstand. Because one of the things I'm often asked is, OK, this government, the other government is much better either. Why, why should we choose the other one? It's the wrong question. Because given impunity, Gabriel would be corrupt. Mm. And I think we have a system where it, people can get away with anything. And while that is the case, while there is no accountability, while there's no transparency, you will always have repression and corruption. And I think what has to change is not the people necessarily, but the system. And that we need to work together at. Right? Well, since he's not going to do it, you can also help him by buying his book, <laughs> The Tide Will Turn, <laughs> which has the story and the photos and also Talk to Selma, who's right here, because he has a brilliant idea to take that photographic exhibit that he showed you about how he disrupted the mosque and tour it. 
uh, with other faith communities in New York. And to put a final button on it and to take us to lunch, you, were the, you had an accidental birth, you were an accidental photographer, and what people might not know is you were accidentally named because your name at birth was not Shahidul. End on that story. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, my father's Professor Mansoor, quite a famous man, I didn't know this. We have a library back home and I'm digging through that and I come up with Mansoor's Media, which is named after my dad, but you know, he forgot to mention that. Anyway, so and my mum's quite well known too. My brother and I, we decided we didn't really want to be known as the children of famous parents. We wanted an identity for ourselves. So we went to our parents and said, we want to change our names. Why? And we gave them this argument. They thought it was a reasonable argument. So I was given the name Shahidul Alam, which actually the way it's spelt at that time was a witness of the world. At some point it became martyr of the world. So I'm not sure quite where I stand right now. <laughs> witness, let's stick with <laughs> yeah, witness. And actually, there is a reference in, in Egyptian mythology about linkages between witness and martyr. So, but that's another story. Give it up there. to Shahidul Alam, witness of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been yeah. fantastic. Thank you. You're the one. Oh. I should take a picture. I should take a picture of this. Ah. Hey, thank you. Don't go away. I'm going to take a picture of you. Well, it won't be a selfie. <laughs> Can you guys just yep. kind of... Oh, no, no, I'm going to do this bit. pun. Wow. I'm Vince, too. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. And now lunch. Thank you, well done. Thank you everyone. Uh, a reminder, cameras can be cleaned. Your badge is good for admission to the museum.